Bible is filled full of metaphors and imagery that relate to athletics. And if you like sports of any type, that's probably compelling to you. But it creates sometimes in my mind a level of, of inconsistency or even confusion. Because the implication of a sports metaphor is that if I work hard enough, if I discipline myself enough, if I practice enough, if I do all the right things, then I can accomplish this goal, whatever that goal might be. But in spirituality, the message of the Bible is real clear. You and I cannot accomplish anything spiritually. We, we can't accomplish our own holiness. We can't accomplish our own righteousness. We will fall short. We will disqualify ourselves every single time. And so salvation, forgiveness, a relationship with God becomes something that is given to us from God. Now, how do, I, how do I take this free gift and then how do I work it in my mind? How do, I, how, do I, how do I make it gel in my life that I have this free gift, but there are expectations that with this gift, I will excel and I will go someplace and I will do something and accomplish something with this gift. And so it's, it's hard sometimes to balance because it's not about what I can do. It's about what Jesus has already done. But yet, knowing what Jesus has already done has convinced me I should do better. I should try my very best to do what Jesus might expect of me. Years ago, I mean, a long, long time ago, and I know I realized this weekend, ladies, um, that the last three or four weeks we've had hunting illustrations. And I don't know what to tell you, but yesterday was opening day. March will get here soon enough and you won't have to hear about it anymore. I mean, I just, you know, the best thing I can probably advise you is when next time you see Carrie in one of our services, my wife, give her a hug and say, I am so sorry. I am, I am sorry that you have to live October through January with this. But I was thinking about, uh, you know, one of those gifts that was sort of a life transforming gift. I was, I was helping a friend of mine. Uh, he owned a big ranch down in Del Rio, Texas. And Every year I would take a couple of weeks off in January and go down and help guide some of his hunts. And one year we were out, we'd gone to lunch back here in Houston and we stopped by a gun store and, and he ended up giving me a very nice rifle as a gift. Do you know, I did nothing to deserve that. I didn't earn it. It wasn't pay or, or compensation. It was just a gift. But it compelled me to make absolutely sure I was completely qualified or capable of using it effectively. I probably put more time in deciding that rifle, working with that rifle, understanding that rifle, maintaining that rifle than any other firearm I've ever had because I was just overwhelmed with the gift. And I think this is kind of how spirituality works. I know it's a stretch. Guns to, guns to Jesus. I mean, it's just a stretch. And so just, you know, hang with me. But when I think about what Jesus has done for me, I just want to make sure I use that gift right, appropriately. In a sense, I want what I do with this gift God has given me, what I, my actions, I want that to honor him. And I think that's what Peter is talking about in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning of verse 13. When he's talking, he's been, the whole letter so far has talked about salvation, God's love for us, God's gift in that salvation, the salvation that's being experienced now, the, the totality of what that salvation will be like at the end of time in heaven. And yet, right in the middle of this letter, Peter gives extremely practical, using athletic or sports terminology, application to take that gift live with it thrive with it flourish with it with focus with an intensity that accomplishes something with the gift that God has given us this is what Peter says if you're looking in your Bible we're in first Peter chapter 1 we're in verse 13 Peter says as a result of all the salvation he's talking to, so your translation should begin with therefore, because everything that's gone on before verse 13 is now being summed up and, and put into application. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, 
you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, and Peter quotes from the book of Leviticus, be holy because I am holy. And now relax for a minute, take a deep breath. I am not here to condemn your lifestyle. I am not here to tell you that everything you did last night or yesterday or this morning was wrong. But I am here to say we have received a great and magnificent gift in the forgiveness God has given us in Jesus. So where do we go with that? What do we do with that? How do we live this thriving, flourishing life in Christ? With a focus, with an, with an intensity, with a desire, with a recognition. This is what Jesus has done. And I want every action, every activity, everything I do to reflect how grateful I am. He begins and he talks about what, what I'm just simply, I'm going to use athletic terminology as well. I got had the privilege of being a sports dad for a number of years, one in football, one in, one in track and cross country. And it's what we would do on Thursday nights or on Friday mornings. And that's getting psyched up. Look at what Peter says in verse 13. Therefore, with your minds ready for action. L literally, that word translates, and some of your translations will say that. Literally, it says, gird up your loins. Not terminology we use a lot today. It literally means to, to take the robes that were a part of the first century A.D. and take those robes and tie them up around your waist, pull them up so that you're able to run, you're able to work, you're able to fight, whatever, whatever it is. If it's an athletic analogy about a race, it's much like the author of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews in chapter 12 says that when you're running the race of this life, the first thing you do is throw off every sin that will entangle you or ensnare you. Put everything, lay every hindrance aside. That's the concept Peter has here. Get your mind ready. Prepare for the race. Prepare for the endeavor. Prepare for the fight. Be ready and it begins in your mind. So every Thursday night as a father of a cross-country runner, we would have pasta. Because pasta and the carbs, um, while these days somewhat disdained by some certain different types of health groups, was the key to the fuel and the energy that would need it for long-distance marathon races on Friday. Every Friday morning, my son and I, his junior and senior year of high school, we commuted together. We had the one vehicle and we would leave and, and the high school was just beyond here at the church and so it was on the same pathway and we, I would either drop him off at the high school or he would drop me off at the, at the office and he would take the truck on up to the high school and I would come into the office. I prayed more during those days than probably any other time. I loved my truck, I loved my son, but the two of them together wasn't always my favorite circumstance. But we would, so we would get in the car and you may not recognize some of the groups like Lecrae or Skillet and some of those Christian groups, but he would turn on the radio and he would turn it up and, and the team was all wearing their jerseys that day because Friday night lights in Texas is something you psych yourself up for. Not just a football player. If you're in the band or a cheerleader or if you're in the stands, it's something you get ready for. And, and here's Peter telling us, in our spirituality, as a result of the salvation we've received in Jesus, get wound up, prepare your mind, get in a proper mental state to do what God wants you to do. And he's not telling us exactly what God wants us to do. He's leaving that open. He's going to deal fundamentally with our character but get psyched up. Therefore, with your minds ready for action. But it's not just a mental game. It does require some control or some discipline. In the HCSB Bible, it says be serious. In the CSB Bible, it's a more literal translation. It says be sober-minded. This, this is a phrase that literally means don't be drunk. And it was a phrase that Peter was familiar with, his audience at that time was familiar with, but it deals with control. It doesn't deal with the, the actual influence of alcohol, except the negative influence of alcohol. That when you're under control by any substance, any substance can, can cause you to lose control. Sugar can cause you to lose control. I mean, anything can cause you to lose control. Anything that you do that causes you to lose control causes you to lose your focus. You can't flourish if something else is in control. And so Peter tells this crowd, prepare your minds for action. Get ready. 
But at the same time, make sure you're in control. Don't do anything that causes you to lose control. In other words, don't get distracted. And don't, and don't lose the ability to move forward. And it's, it's just a simple little phrase, but it's so powerful in our spirituality. Because so often where we fail spiritually is in areas that where we just simply need to stay in control. Those areas that we fail in are oftentimes spiritual discipline. And so it takes control to pray. Now, I prefer casual prayer, quite honestly. And so I talk to God when I pray as if I was talking to one of you. If we were driving together someplace to eat, I would talk to God the exact same way you and I would talk about different things, things that are on my mind. But prayer is one of those things that oftentimes requires discipline. I need to make an effort to have that conversation. I remember reading years ago, I don't even remember the author, but it was in a marriage book, and he talked about one of the problems many married couples have is that guys typically use, I believe it was 20 to 30,000 words a day. Ladies typically use 60 to 70,000 words a day. Don't shoot the messenger. I read it in a book. I will research and try to figure which book it was if you want to know who it was. But the bottom line of the principle was women spoke about two-thirds more than guys do. The problem is when you get home from work, and it was an old book, so primarily men were gone at the time, and they're coming home to the house. They had used up their 20,000. They had, they had talked to everybody they needed to at work, especially if they were a salesman or in some type of very active, interactive business. And they just didn't want to talk. It wasn't that they didn't love their wives. It wasn't that they didn't care for them. They just had used up their allocation for the day. Now imagine if she's a stay-at-home mom, and maybe the kids are too little to have conversations with. She hasn't even begun. <laughs> the premise of the book was simply this. Guys, when we get home, even if we've used up all of our words for the day, discipline yourself to go ahead and have that conversation with the most important person in your life. Another author described it as, as preparing a lunch in the morning, taking the lunch to work, eating your lunch at work, and then you come home and you hand your wife the leftover brown bag with all the grease stains on it. She doesn't want the leftovers. Well, neither does God. And so sometimes prayer requires discipline. Sometimes it requires control. Reading the Bible requires control. Do whatever it takes. Some people work better on plans. Some people work better setting a specific time of the day. But control ourselves to do those things that allow us to have focus in our spirituality. Allow us to have control. Not because we're forgetting it's a gift. I'm not doing this so that I can be a, a Christian. I am doing this because I am a Christian. I'm, I'm not seeking to earn something here. But God has given me something. He has gifted me something that I'm so proud of and so thankful for. I want to do this. So prepare your minds, Peter says. Get, get, go ahead and get psyched up. Think about what's going to happen and prepare yourselves for it. Be sober-minded. And then in the latter part of verse 13, he says, And set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is actually the only imperative in this, in this particular section. This is a command. The idea of setting your hope on the grace to be brought to you at the final revelation. This is the judgment day he's referring to. At the end of time, set your mind on that hope. This is, this is simply the idea. In sports, we call it visualizing. I remember when I was trying to learn how to play golf, something I never actually accomplished. I was talking to the pro one day and I was, I was trying to get some advice and we were at the driving range and, and I'm sitting there and I'm practicing and I'm trying and, and I'm trying to do everything and he kept telling me, be the ball. <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking this game is making less sense by the minute. Why do I want to be a ball that I'm about to smack as hard as I possibly can? But I'm thinking, okay. And he's telling, he's walking me through. Made me close my eyes. Close your eyes, James. Picture yourself as the ball. Picture yourself leaving the fairway. Picture yourself soaring down the fairway. Picture yourself landing on the green. Picture yourself slowly, gently, peacefully rolling into the hole. I thought, I got this. I, I reared back. I was ready. 
boom, sliced right back off out of the way. Once again, all the time, every single time. And he got kind of, you know, took a deep breath to avoid getting irritated with me. He says, James, be the ball. And I said, the ball's me. Look at my life. My whole life is a slice. It's never going down the fairway. That's the problem. I'm the ball and the ball is me and the ball can't go straight the way it's supposed to. I was a little frustrated at the time. I didn't quite quit yet, but it was getting close to that line. But there is, there is validity to that, visualizing in any sport. I don't know about rodeo. I don't, I don't know that anybody walks up to a cowboy and says, okay, your eight seconds is coming up. Be the bull. I mean, I don't think so. I don't know. But, you know, but almost every sport, almost every endeavor, we're told one of the best ways to prepare is to visualize. And now Peter is telling us, think about it. Think, think about what's coming. Set your hope, he says. Set your hope on this revelation of the grace that is going to be brought to you. And I like that. I do that sometimes. I just pause and I stop and I think about what's it going to be like? What, what will it be like to be in heaven? I mean, what will it be like to wake up in the morning and then realize, hold it. There's no, there's no time like there is here. And there's no, there's no necessity for rest. Maybe I don't wake up. Maybe I'm always awake in heaven. Think about what it's going to be. You know, think about the things that you enjoy most and then put them into this celestial end of time experience in heaven. Think about being able to visit anybody you've ever known that's also in heaven with you. Think about what it's going to be like to never be confused. If you go off in heaven, which I've heard rumors that people believe that that's possible, it's always going to go down the fairway because heaven's perfect. It's never going to slice. It's, it's, never, it's never going to be wrong. Think about what it's going to be like to never experience pain. To, 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 whether it's self-inflicted or not. I mean, I'm one of those kind of clumsy people. I inflict pain on myself all the time. I, I just, you know, and it, it's kind of frustrating. But I'm not, never going to stub my toe in heaven. I'm like never going to cut myself. I'm pretty sure one of the things we don't need in heaven is a Band-Aid or a Tylenol. Because it tells us there's no more pain. Think about, visualize, spiritually set our hope on the grace that is going to be brought to us. This is what God has done for us. He's given us a gift and he says to us, this gift is yours free. I've made it possible through Jesus. This is your hope. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything to specifically get this and qualify in some way or another. But imagine it, grasp it, enjoy it, and embrace it. Set your hope on the grace that is to be brought to you. You know, I mean, think about that, the, the idea of visualizing. Think about what God has done, what God is doing, and what is ahead. And the truth is, this moves us to a place of focus. It, it takes us away from just simply being a spectator. Imagine with me for just a moment. You go into your favorite restaurant, and you run into an Olympic athlete. Somebody who's already been to the Olympics, it's a possibility in our region. We have a number of Olympic athletes in our region training for it, as well as those that have already accomplished it and already earned their go and, and made, their, made their, their goals and their position in their sports. We, so it's possible you could run across them. Imagine talking to them, and they're, and they're in their outfit. Then maybe they got that special of, you know, windsuit that says they are an Olympic athlete. They're part of Team USA. And you begin to discuss with them, what was it like? How was, how was it when you were there? And, and in that conversation, you, you're asking them, you know, at, at some point, I, think th I know I would do this, I'm driven enough. At some point, I would say, where did you place? And they say, well, well I, didn't, I didn't place. I didn't, I didn't go to place. This windsuit was what I wanted. I was a participant. I was there. I said, so you didn't get a bronze? You didn't get a silver? You didn't get a gold? Oh, no, that was never part of my plan. My plan was to travel free to the Olympics, be able to be there, walk in the parade, 
and have everybody look at me when I wear my windsuit. So that's why I wear it to the restaurant. So you know I'm an Olympic athlete. I am not a gold medalist, but I'm an Olympic athlete. I am guessing no Olympic athlete ever in their life said, I just wanted to go. They all said, I wanted to go for gold. And I think about that. There's, you know, there's kind of three groups of people that go to the Olympics. You got your spectators, your tourists, who pay their way to go. And they'll take all their pictures and they'll tell everybody they went to the Olympics, but there was never any intention of doing anything that required any effort. Then you got maybe participants, although I think that's probably few and far between. And then you have medalists. You have winners. When we think about winning something, when we think about focus, when we think about a coin, go ahead and take it to that place. To that, that's what, and that's what Peter's saying. Moving into heaven is the gold medal moment for Christians. And, and yes, I didn't qualify myself to be there. Jesus qualified me to be there. But the Bible is also completely clear that how I live after Jesus qualifies me to go makes a difference on how that moment is like in my relationship with Jesus. You, many of you know the verse. You remember it. When Jesus talked about successful businessmen that took the things God gave them and achieved great things with them, Jesus' words were, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's the gold. And now Peter's saying, set your hope on that grace to be revealed. Imagine what it'll be like to be in the presence of Jesus and have him look at you or look at me and say, well done. Not because I'm going to earn this, but because the gift is motivating me to take it to the highest level possible. Which means I need to evade some things. I need to be careful. And Peter reminds us of that in verse 15, I mean, verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. You had a way of life before you met Jesus. You have a way of life after you meet Jesus. Don't conform back to who you used to be. Paul said the same thing as he wrote to the church at Rome. He says, therefore, as a part of our spiritual acts of worship, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And of course, that mind is in Christ. There are things you just need to avoid. There are things that we need to, we need to escape and, and be careful that it doesn't happen. I went to every cross-country meet and I went to every track meet and I sat there and I watched my daughter on that field or watched my daughter on that track and I prayed that she didn't tangle up with another runner. Because when all the runners are wearing spikes, getting caught up with somebody else can be a very painful experience. And so she had to focus on the goal winning, crossing the tape, but she also had to focus on evading those around her who might unintentionally or intentionally seek to spike her, injure her, disqualify her. Remember, Peter's writing to Christians who are living in a persecuted country. They're in a very anti-Christian culture and climate. He's reminding them in this pressure, in this moment, in this race, don't let yourself get tangled up with what will injure you. Avoid these things that were part of your old way of life, a part of the way that the rest of the world wants you to conform to. Nonconformity spiritually is a good thing. Embrace it. So that in the end, and I'm calling this being correlated, in the end, we begin to reflect our Father. But as the one who called you, verse 15, the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Now, holiness scares us. And so we, we immediately begin to think, and you may have already gone there even as I read it. Okay, well, I've got this and I've got this. But I begin to think of my infractions. I begin to think of the, the grievances. I begin to think of the complaints against my spirituality. But what if, what if Peter meant not just thinking of the wrongs, but thinking of what can be? I mean, he's telling us, the one who's called us is holy. So we are to be holy in our conduct. I mean, we've all seen it. We experienced it when we were kids. We saw it when we had kids. We watched other people do it. We begin to mimic those that we like. You know, the little child that, that walks in and, and finds dad's shoes or, or dad's boots in the mudroom and puts them on and wants to walk around how, the house 
proud of the fact that he's wearing dad's boots. They don't fit. They're not practical. It's not workable at this point in time. But the desire, the drive to be like dad is there. It's legit and it's realistic. There's an outfitter. They used to make hunting jackets and and one of their ads, they ran for a number of years about their jackets because they're expensive and they're extremely durable. The ads simply said, your son will smile when he wears your jacket. And the implication was if you buy this, it's durable enough that it'll last more than one generation. And I watched my son the first time he actually wore a jacket that his grandfather handed down to me that was handed down to him. And I watched him smile and I said, yeah. There's something for the most part in most healthy relationships that makes us want to be like dad, makes us want to be like mom, makes us want to do whatever mom's doing. That's what Peter's saying. Here's your heavenly father. And yes, he is holy beyond comprehension. And yes, he's righteous beyond understanding. And yes, he's majestic beyond even the ability to be in his presence without the gift of righteousness through Jesus. But it's okay to imitate him. It's okay to want to be like him. And like the little boy who puts on his dad's boots, I am probably at some point in time going to stumble and going to fall because it just doesn't fit exactly right. But if my hope is set on that day when the grace is revealed, guess what? That day when I stand before Jesus and I'm in God's presence to worship for all eternity, guess what? The holiness of God will fit for the first time. And so it's okay if I want to be like God now. I don't want to be God-like. I don't want to be God, but I want to be like him. I want to imitate my father. And it happens that he's holy. And so there's a call on my life to be holy, to correlate myself, to, to image myself, to identify myself with him who is holy. All the while knowing this is possible because God made it possible through Jesus. Every failure can be forgiven when I trust in Jesus. Every mistake can be wiped out and given a new fresh slate to move on from because of Jesus. Every trip, every stumble, every fall, every pain can be healed and can be corrected and can be used to lies to help me better achieve the goals of my spirituality because of Jesus. All this is possible not because I'm an exceptional spiritual athlete, but because God is an especially loving father who says, let me work on your transformation. Trust me and I'll make this happen. I can be holy now and perfected in holiness in heaven because of Jesus. But because of Jesus, I want to get this right. I want to live. I want to thrive. I want to flourish with focus in my mind, in my heart, in my life. Let's take a moment to pray. 